He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Um, lovely. Well, I mean, should we just, should we just do it? Let's just Let's do just it. Let's just do it. All right. How long do you want, do you think? I think about maybe, we've got half an hour. Um, I mean, you can edit out the boring bits. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, hello. Hello. Um, the first thing to note here, I think, is that you were desperately unhelpful in collating this <laughs> list of interviews. Um, you claimed that you didn't remember what happened last week, let alone your favourite interviews. Now, is that true? Do you yeah, it's really, pretty true. Really, you don't remember the interviews that you've done? Once it's done, it's, no. it's done. No. I mean, when I looked through the list that you kindly compiled, I, I, for most of them, I remember talking to them. Um, but I do not remember the content of any of them. Hmm. Any of them. It's like swatting for an exam and then everything falls out your head. Right. You did suggest one interview, Burt Reynolds. Yeah. Why? Uh, because it was so unexpected. Yeah. I mean, for a start, you know, you talk to people who are very famous like Burt Reynolds and in the decline of their careers and you expect them to be a bit sad or bad, you mm. know? But he was utterly charming. Yeah. And... People were so surprised by the charm of him and the fact that he charmed me, I suppose, because people think that I'm not easily charmed, <laughs> um, that people loved it. And consequently, I loved it too. Do you see yourself as a bit of a proxy f- for the audience in that sense? Do you think that your reaction colours their reaction? You mean if I enjoy the interview, then they'll enjoy it too? Yeah. But I usually do enjoy interviews and they don't always enjoy them, people. I mean, one of the one of the interviews you're running is Don Brash, right? Yeah. Well, somebody described that as a really painful interview to listen to, mm. <laughs> and he was, you know, I was talking to him about his position on Toreo and having too much Toreo, and he'd particularly targeted Guy on Espinar, mm. I think, who um, had spoken um, beautiful bits of Toreo on Morning Report. You know, the greetings. Who could object? Don Brash could and did. And it was a painful interview because he's so painfully earnest <laughs> and so easy to take the pee out of, which is irresistible. I mean, I don't dislike him at all. I but... wanted to I wanted to ask you about that interview because um mm. I, I really liked it. I thought it was a very, very interesting interview. I don't think it was painful to listen to at all. Interesting, but also I mean there was a school of thought that we should not have spoken to him at all. Why give him publicity? Yeah. And I didn't take that view. I don't I mean that's the kind of attitude that I abhor in general. I mean, you know. The first interview I listened to of the Sponge was one that you did back in two thousand and six with John Clark and Sam Neill. No. Oh. Um yeah, it's lovely. And one of the reasons that it's lovely is that you seem like you're having a very good time in the interview. Oh, who wouldn't? Well, I mean, d- they're d- both. Do you, do you have absolutely. fun? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely I have fun with some people. It's just lovely. How could you not have fun with John Clark and Sam Neill? I talked to, to both of them a few times on their own, and they're always absolutely lovely. Uh, is there an element of um, performance or theatre to yep. your job? It, does that make it easier to connect to, to actors or, or performers in particular? No. Nah. No? I don't think so. I just think it's um, in any kind of media, including print media. Mm. If you're writing features or running features on the telly or the radio, there's always room for performance. And, in the, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a performative thing. It's my frustrated thespianism. Is it? Yeah. I think so. Well, because one of the things that... But that makes me sound inauthentic. <laughs> well, it um, doesn't really. There's a good quote. I think it's from Catherine Ryan, actually, talking to, to someone, Mark Jennings or something like that, where she says, the thing that you can't do in radio is pretend to be anything other than yourself because you'll get found out within 10 minutes. Do you think that's true? Uh, that's quite interesting. Yeah, I think she's probably right. I hadn't thought about that. But yeah, I think she's probably right. And you can get away with pretending, oddly enough, you can get away with pretending on the telly, even though there's more evidence to be held against you, what with the pictures as well. But on the radio, it's somehow more revealing when you just got the voice. Strange, isn't it? 
there are lots of good interviews here. Um, and lots of them are with very famous people who have been interviewed thousands of times before and are very slick. I know. One that comes to mind is, in the list is, is Dolly Parton, which was a delightful interview and who is a delightful person. So she's probably not a great example here. But my question is, you know, do you have to work harder to make interviews with very famous people interesting? You have to work harder to make them interesting, yes. You don't... You can't... You can not do any work at all, mm-hmm. and they'll still they'll still run. Mm-hmm. I mean, people will still listen to them because they're famous people. But in order to make them real interviews, yeah, you do have to work harder and try try and find a question that might surprise them or take them somewhere mm-hmm. that they haven't been before. I mean, a good example of this is because it doesn't always work, right? I mean, famous people can be the most tedious people. Mm. Bernie Taupin, for example, mm. who's not on your list, thankfully. <laughs> um, he has recently written a book about him and Elton John and his whole life. And he uh, he was so boring. Mm. I mean, he responded to every other question. Well, you can read about that in my book. Uh. And the book itself, I have no qualms in saying this, the book itself is astonishingly overwritten Mm. to the point of incomprehensibility. But good stories in there. But he was bored and he was unengaged. And so we ran him in the end as a pre-recorded interview, Um, fortunately, because we made him sound less like a prick, Mm. took out some of the, well, you can read about that in my book. And, you know, he sounded all right. But clearly... He was. He didn't turn up for the interview. In short, he mm. just thought he was too important. That's for, funny because I've se- I saw Elton John in concert once in we- in Wellington, and I had that kind of feeling about the performance that it was it was so slick. It was like a day at work. You know, it was like he was going to open up his piano and say, "It's so great to be here in Chick's Notes, uh. Wellington." <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I haven't interviewed Elton John, so I wouldn't be able to testify to that. But Bernie Taupin, nah. M- musicians. There are several musicians here from various genres, actually. Uh, Dolly, as I mentioned, Sonny Rollins, uh, Lord. Uh, are musicians different to interview to other artists as a rule because they communicate... Not verbally. Not verbally. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely true. And and because I don't want to talk about, you know, how they go from G to C in that second mm. chord, um, because I can't, I do want to talk to them about themselves or their songs or how much of themselves goes into their songs. And sometimes they just, they don't want to do it because they've written their songs and there's nothing more to say. Sometimes they're great. Sometimes, Paul Kelly, the Australian musician mm. whom I really, really like, I did an interview with him ages ago and I could not get two words out of him. It was just dead in the water. Mm. And then my producer at the time, Chris Burke, suggested him again a couple of years later. I said, no, please, don't make me do it. And he said, talk to him about cricket. Right. And I thought, cricket? Okay. So I, you know, swatted up on stumps or whatever they are. And, of course, he's written the great song about Don Bradman. Mm. So I could have figured, off he went. You know, suddenly I'd found the button to press. And that's thanks to the producer, nothing to do with me. So, you know. On the other side of the coin to musicians and famous people more generally, I suppose, you know, there are plenty of people here on this list uh, who are not especially famous, but who've done quite extraordinary or incongruous things. Uh, Hugh McCarroll, who designed a suit for pooing in space. The delightful Loyola Galvin, the gardening nun. I love that one. Or even John O, the straight male escort. Are those interviews with I suppose not norm, normal people sound so disparaging. I don't mean yes. it in that kind of way, but you know, non-famous people are they more exciting and, and fun in a way, or, or just different? Yeah, they are, and in, in many ways they are because you never know how it's going to go. I mean, one of the interviews you've got on your list is a double interview with JJ Joseph and Cess Lashley. Wow, uh, the late Cess Lashley mm. and JJ Joseph had written a book called Fighting for My Life. It was an extraordinarily honest book about um, his uh, his own domestic violence, men and violence was the theme of it and it was maybe the first time he'd been on live radio and somebody wrote about it 
and said, it started like a train wreck. And and so I, I, I would have been, and the listeners would have been thinking, oh God, how's this going to go? But slowly over time, and the beauty of Saturday morning is that you've got the time to just let things go mm. and get into the pace of other people. And slowly he opened up. And it was, it was um, a really, really interesting session. I mean, thank God that Cecil Lashley was there as well because mm. she kind of helped us through it. But it was, um, it was interesting. As you say, people who are not famous, are not used to being interviewed, are often uh, vulnerable sounds um, a bit predatory on my part, but you know what I mean. Yeah. I wanted to talk about that one, actually, and I, th- I think the the reason that people think it sounded like it got off like a train wreck is that the first question that you ask JJ is you, you ask him what he did to his partner, um, and, and he quite brutally assaulted his partner. and I, He wasn't expecting the question, I don't think, such a direct question and he can't really answer it there's a long silence and he struggles to get the words out Mm. in a moment like that what's going through your mind um probably what a stupid question to ask but also you just sometimes you have to sit and wait and you know pauses on the radio are the best thing the scariest thing though right yeah they are but also riveting. Mm. The space is 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 often far more articulate than the words. I remember working with with, um, with a person who was quite new, so there's no blame attached. Um, but they were asked to tidy up an interview that I pre-recorded. By tidy up, I mean, you know take out the mm. the bits that are boring perhaps or it's hardly anything but what they did was they went through the entire interview and took out every single breath mm. and and every single pause and so there was nothing left but just this string of words mm. it was the most extraordinary thing i mean i couldn't understand why they had done that but it was a good exercise <laughs> in why the words aren't the most important thing. It's how they sit with each other. There are a few interviews here about New Zealand and our relationship with with ourselves, I suppose, you know, and our, our search for identity. And I'm thinking here of uh, Ranganui Walker, who, whom you spoke to in 2004. That was just after the Foreshore and Seabed Act was passed. Also, Michael King, you interviewed him a lot of times, but um, this one is just a few months, I think, before he died. D- do you like talking about New Zealand? I do, but it's always a bit tricky, isn't it? Because yeah. it's like trying to lift yourself up. Rangi Walker, I remember, was a, was a, was quite a tricky interview because you have to ask questions that I'm sure to Professor Walker and to a lot of the audience sounded stupid, Hmm. you know, but there's a whole nother part of the audience that is asking those questions and wants the answers. And so while stupid questions are perfectly valid in most interviews, if you ask stupid stupid questions about Māori and race in New Zealand, mm. you come over as a racist. And there's always that risk. So, you know, you just have to shoulder it and bear it. You know, why do you think, Dr Walker, that um, uh, Māori should be an official language? You know, that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. Uh, it's They just have to be asked. But I don't think he liked it much, although he was very gracious and charming. He was very, ge- he was very generous. And, and listening to that interview now in 2023 is it's it's really interesting i found it fascinating to listen to because i think if you were doing that interview this weekend it would be very different oh well new zealand is so different uh, right so it is really so different i mean despite the the don brashes and despite the the uh, the government policy at the moment to get te reo out of it new zealand remains a different place and so yeah it would be a different interview 
lots of very funny people here. Uh, Armando Iannucci, Bill Bailey, uh, Catelyn Moran, David Sedaris, who ah. I, I think that's my favourite one of He's the He's divine, bunch. David Sedaris. Yeah. I love him. He just gives you this impression of being completely honest. He's got this bizarre family yeah. to draw on. And, I, you know, I, he doesn't make it up. And one charming thing about David Sedaris that, that other people could emulate is, and I think he does it with everybody, after an interview, he sends people a note or a postcard. Mm. And I really like that. I had a David Sedaris postcard on my fridge for a long time. There are a couple of interviews with the spectre of Donald Trump looming in the background. Uh, the Yanucci one that I just mentioned. Then you, you also you. That's right, because that was just after Trump got in. Yeah, and it was very fitting to have him on because he was sort of like, "Well, I'm I'm screwed now." Yeah, what am I going to do? Nothing satire. Nothing satire anymore. Uh, you also did Scott Brown. I think there was a lot of response to, to that, <laughs> the former US ambassador to, yeah. to New Zealand. A Mr. Universe at some stage, or yeah. a Mr. Playboy. Or... Yeah, I think you relished pointing that out. That he he was... was kind of fabulous, though, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. He was um, unapologetic. That was a, a strange little window of time, actually, because I I looked up when we spoke to him... And he was saying that Anthony Scaramucci, who yeah. had just become communications director for Trump, was a very good friend of his, Scott, that is, and he recommended him for the job and the blah, blah. Well, he held that job, Scaramucci, for a nanosecond. <laughs> it was about four days, wasn't it? Ten. <laughs> Ten days. And then he had the misfortune to say something nasty about the Trump administration, which is perfectly reasonable because he spent his whole career as a Democrat, yeah. said something derogatory about the Trump administration to a New Yorker reporter, <laughs> who duly reported him. He said, oh, I thought it was off the record. <laughs> this is a communications director. <laughs> anyway, he was gone, Berger. I thought that was very funny. I mean, the other, the other interview that has that, that Trump shadow hanging over it, I think, is the, the David Simon one. And... I am just. I am curious, just as to whether you ever, whether you've come to terms with what a truly extraordinary time that Trump election and presidency was. Everybody was just, what happened? Yeah. What just happened, weren't they? And I think they still are to some extent. Yeah. I mean, I think it's changed. Certainly, people like David Simon, you know, progressive Americans' view of themselves and of their country. They can't believe it happened mm. and could happen again. Some of the most thrilling interviews here, I think, are when you are talking to uh, strong, accomplished, opinionated women about uh, womanness and feminism and femininity. Uh, people like Camille Parlier and, and Margaret Atwood, which is a terrific interview with Margaret Atwood, and Jermaine Greer and uh, Annette King. Is that a subject that is dear or personal t to you? No. No? No. I No, it's not. Um, in that I am a woman mm -hmm. and a feminist, it's no more personal than that. I mean, it's more personal than if I were to do an interview with um, uh, a wrestler, for example. <laughs> but because it goes viscerally to the heart of what one is and what society is all about. I suppose, yeah. Well, I suppose, <laughs> I suppose what, the answer is yes. I suppose what I mean by that question is that you have lived during a time in which life for women in New Zealand and in Western countries more broadly has changed s significantly and whether that is... Some, and you've had the opportunity to talk to thinkers in this space who have really been, been there for, for a lot of it and... I guess whether that's something that you pontificate on or, or sort of m muse on. Pontificate? <laughs> pontificate? <laughs> Far be it from me. I mean, Camille Parley is an interesting one, right? Yeah. Because she, you can't put her in any pigeonhole at all. No, she just she, identi she identifies as transgender, yeah. but she says, no, I'm not in favour of all this transgender business going on at the moment, you know. And she's known for 
insulting practically every other feminist yeah. with an earshot. Well, she kind of does that during your interview. You know, she yep. does an absolute drive-by on a bunch of people. It's yep. like, wow, okay. Yep. She's um, she's amazing. So, you know, it's you just have to... She doesn't fit into any feminist ideology that I've ever heard of. She is her own person. And ideology is always, you know, mm. kind of tedious to talk about. It's when people bust out of it that the interesting bits come, isn't it? Lots of these people are artists and have had very interesting lives uh, and experiences that sort of, in, you know, infuse their work. And one that I liked a lot was with Sean Davey, the British photographer, who was on, I suppose, she was on to talk about her book, uh, about her daughter, but the conversation really kind of just takes a life of its own, that one. Where did it go? Well, it, I can't remember. It went into her life as a mother and as a, as a stepmother and it, 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 it sort of... On the autonomy of children. Yeah, yeah it, yeah, it just, yeah. It, it kind of, it, I mean, it's about the book, but really the book is about her and her her life and it goes to weird and wonderful sorts of places and th- th- my question for this one is you know w- can you feel it when an interview is doing that is taking yes. on a life of its yes, own yes yes it's fantastic mm. it's fantastic and it just yeah as you say has an energy of its own and and you know that it's no longer an interview but it is a conversation mm. that is as revealing in many ways because people are more relaxed and they offer more. It's um, it's a genuinely great feeling. Cullum Toybean. I love him. He was lovely. He's so good. I mean, you talk about a generous interviewee. Mm-hmm. He's the archetypal generous interviewee. He's just lovely. And by which I mean he, you know, he answers questions, then he offers something else up. Mm-hmm. And he makes the questioner feel in some way smart Mm -hmm. without saying that incredibly, I mean, no doubt meaningful, but incredibly tedious. Well, that's a very good question. What a good question. What a good question. Which, you know, if they're in pre-records, we take them out because it's just a hold up and it's often just playing for time. But Kong Toy Bean, no, he's a lovely, lovely man and a brilliant writer. You had correspondents as well on the show, you know, people who you spoke to regularly. And we have a couple of interviews with them in here. Uh, Kate Camp, you had a lot of lovely chats with Kate Camp. Great, and, um, great woman, Kate Camp. Yeah. And very talented poet as well. And, and Paul Callahan as well, who, who would come oh. on and talk science. Yeah. It, is it fun when you know the person who is... Coming when you're, I guess yeah. you're, you're kind of friends with them, right? Yeah, yeah. So you can, it's like you don't, you can cut straight to the topic of conversation. And the mm. audience knows them as well, and so there's a certain comfort and a certain um, prehistory that you don't need to go into. Um, and their idiosyncrasies are loved and accepted. It's it's great. I mean, Paul was a classic. You mm. know, people just. Loved him because he he was able to talk about very complicated things, in not in a simplistic way at all, but in a way that conveyed enthusiasm, and we put them to. I mean, this was not. I think that interviews should stay interviews in time and space and bagger off quite mm-hmm. soon. But somebody said, "Look, we want to put the conversations between you and Paul into a book." Mm-hmm. And I said, oh, no, I mean, they were just, you know, there were moments in time and blah, blah. Anyway, thus it came. And we called the book As Far As We Know, hmm. which I thought was brilliant. May have been my idea. Can't remember. But I still think it was brilliant because it uh, expresses the idea of science that as far as we know this is the case, but something might happen tomorrow to change what we know. Mm. And Paul was all about that. He was a fantastic, enthusiastic scientist. What is a good interview meant to do? Oh, God. I mean, you've got the Rethian thing, right? Entertain, inform, educate. Mm-mm. Make people want to listen and enjoy something that they didn't expect to. Mm. Find something interesting 
And those are the best kind of communications I get from the audience, really. I started listening to this. I didn't think I'd enjoy it. I didn't think I'd find it interesting. It was great. And that's that's my one of my criteria for a good interview. Are you still learning? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Because I'm so old I've forgotten half of what I knew in the first place, so <laughs> come again? Um, oh, yes, of course. Am I still learning about how to interview yeah, people? Yeah. Ah, nah. Nah. I mean, what do you? What can you learn? Every single person is different. There is no template mm. for long interviews. I mean, there's a template for shorter ones because you you have to you have to control yourself. You know, you have to go who, where, why, what. Morning report. It's much. It's much more disciplined. But on Saturday mornings, when you can go a lot longer, there there is no there is no rule. And so, what could I learn that would be applicable to more than one interview? Each, literally, each one is unique. The audience, we've been very happy, lucky, I should say. We've we've been very lucky to have you, but you've been very lucky to have us in a way too. So you? lucky. Yeah. You know, it's an extraordinarily lucky thing. Who could have a better, more enjoyable job? You know, I've had so much pleasure out of doing this job. Mm. It's extraordinarily good. Love it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.